April and Wayne Show app is now available on Google Play for Android. And donate to help the ministry at aprilandwayneshow.com. People are sitting in church Sunday after Sunday, year after year, and still are not saved because they're listening and believing in ministers who are leading their souls to hell. Jesus explained in the scriptures that those ministers are not going to heaven and they're blocking you from going. It's like the blind leading the blind because the people love their pastors and their churches more than Jesus. Just because a pastor is behind the pulpit doesn't mean that he's preaching from the word of God because they will pervert the word of the living God for their own purpose. That's why the Bible says to try the spirits by the spirits, where they be of God, because there are many false prophets who are gone into the world. Don't listen to preachers, I mean false prophets, who are motivators of prosperity, of self-empowerment, of health and wealth, and teachers of life skills because they say that they're giving you the principles to live by to improve your life. Like most popular preachers and TV ministers on TVN, like Joe Osteen, T.D. Jakes, and Rick Warren. Many ministers are following their teachings instead of the teachings of Jesus Christ because they want to have large churches and large amounts of money at the price of your soul. People need to wake up and realize that their teachings are doctrines of demons to contradict the Bible with half lies and half truths so Satan can get your soul. Their teachings come from the rudiments and wisdom of this world, which is foolishness with God, and is based on the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. God says, this is not of me, but of this world. And the Bible says that those type of ministers are of the world. Therefore, they speak of the world, and the world hears them. The world listens to them, the world believes them, and the world will follow them straight down to hell fire. God says, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. And they will cry aloud and spare not. Lift up that voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and their sins. Ministers are supposed to warn the sinners to save their souls from hell and warn the righteous not to sin so they won't end up in hell. If they don't, God is going to require their blood at their hands. Preachers of the day are afraid to warn their congregation about their sin and talk about hell because they're afraid that the members, the mothers of the church, the deacon board, the board members, and their money might leave. If a minister is not afraid of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he would preach what Jesus preached consistently, not once a year, because God says to teach my word faithfully. They would preach it in season and out of season. They would preach the truth when they want to hear it and when they don't want to hear it until Jesus comes back. Ezekiel 13. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts, Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision, and have ye not spoken a lying divination, whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God.
and mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity, and that divine lies, they shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that ye have daubed with untempered mortar, and bring it down to the ground, so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered, and it shall fall, and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall, and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar, and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart, and prophesy thou against them, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes, and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread, to slay the souls that should not die, and to save the souls alive that should not live? by your lying to my people that hear your lies. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. And I will tear them from your arms, and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Your kerchiefs also will I tear, and deliver my people out of your hand. And they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way, by promising him life. Therefore ye shall see no more vanity, nor divine divinations, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. THE WOLF IN SHEEP'S CLOTHING A wolf found it very difficult in getting to the sheep because of the vigilance of the shepherd and his dogs. But one day it found the skin of a sheep that had been flayed and thrown aside. And so it put the sheep's skin on over its own pelt and walked down among the sheep. A lamb began to follow the wolf in sheep's clothing around. And so the wolf led the lamb away from the others and made a meal of her. For many days he was successful in tricking the sheep, and he had many hearty meals. Appearances can be deceptive. As well, he tells us that God has given us God. He says, blessed be the God who has given himself to us. God has given himself to us. And I can't overstate this. I know sometimes when we come to God, we're like, I want a car that runs. I want a spouse that doesn't. God, here are all the things that I want from you. I want all these blessings from you. A car is great. A spouse is great. Health is great. A job is great. But here's the greatest gift that's ever been given. What's the greatest gift you could give someone? Yourself. 
your love, your life, your heart, your devotion, your commitment, your affection to give yourself. It's why at a wedding, you know what happens? A husband and a wife, a bride and a groom, they'll come together on an altar. Everyone brings gifts except for the bride and groom. They don't bring gifts because they are the gift. A man is giving himself to a woman. A woman is giving herself to the man. The greatest gift we have to give is ourselves. God gave us God. That's amazing. A car is great. God's better. Health is great. God is better. Friends are great. God is better. A job is great, but God is better. And God gives us God. And this is where Paul gets so excited. So excited. He said, let's bless the God who's blessed us. You get that? Let's bless the God who's blessed us. The God who's given us himself, let's give ourselves to him. And this is the explosion of joy that he begins with. Now, some of you say, I have not seen this blessing of which you speak. At the unemployment office, my dumpy condo and on the bus, I even looked under the seat, I found gum, not blessing. I don't see the blessing of which you speak. He says that the blessing is in the heavenly places. Some of the blessing comes here in this life and there is blessing to be sure from God in this life, but much of it is stored up in heavenly places. And it's not because God is withholding it from us. He wants us to enjoy the blessings he has for us forever. So for the believer, this is as close to hell as you'll ever get. For the unbeliever, this is as close to heaven as you'll ever get. For the believer, your blessing awaits you forever. And for the unbeliever, there is no blessing awaiting you forever. And for them, their functional saviors are saviors that cannot save. They are saviors of success, saviors of comfort, saviors of pleasure, saviors of provision. And so the real issue here is one where they are worshiping comfort instead of Christ. And Christ is calling them to do that which is for them uncomfortable. And they would rather have comfort than Christ. And we can look at them and we can judge them and we could say, yes, that's how the haughty, pride, rich people of the world are. And let me just say this, for those of us who are Americans or live in the Western world, we tend to be the haughty, pride-filled, rich people. We live at, a, at, a, at an affluence and a lifestyle that is that is really unparalleled in the history of the world. Uh, Their homes were gigantic. Most of our homes are similarly sized. Their homes had indoor plumbing, which was innovative, and we take it for granted. That for us, we're really not worried, most of us, about whether or not we'll have clothes to wear tomorrow, water to drink, or food to eat. Instead, we just assume that our affluence will continue. And it can lead us into a place of lethargy where heaven doesn't feel like home, that this is a good enough paradise for us, where Christ is not who we live for, but comfort is what we live for. And Jesus comes and he says, though everything is going well physically and materially, I'm very concerned for you spiritually because you've chosen comfort over Christ. And so then he goes on, but first I'd ask you just a few questions. Um, So that we don't just hear about the Laodiceans and then arrogantly stand back and judge them but instead we humbly learn from them knowing that in many ways we're prone to be just like them. And if we don't do that, we end up just reading the Bible like religious people who judge others rather than worshipers who allow the scriptures to judge ourselves. So number one, uh, would you say in your relationship with Jesus, is it cold? You really don't care. Is it lukewarm? You don't care very much. Or is it hot? You really do love Jesus. You really are motivated to get to know him better. You really do want to walk with him and by grace become more like him. Would you say you are cold, lukewarm, or hot? And sadly, what sometimes happens is in Christianity, lukewarmness is accommodated and we just compare ourselves to those who are icy cold. And we think, well, I'm not as bad as they are. No, but we're not where we should be. Uh, Number two, would you say that the church you're in is cold, lukewarm, or hot? And sadly, I think that Jesus' word to the church that it's lukewarm could be a word that is appropriate for many churches. Just lukewarm. Not a real passion, not a real zeal. People aren't giving, praying, serving, caring, trying, risking, innovating. It doesn't bother them that people aren't becoming Christians. It doesn't bother them that lives aren't being transformed in large numbers. It doesn't bother them that that everything is sort of just settled into a comfortable routine. 
And you could kind of imagine it here. Very affluent people going to church and then going out to lunch and then going on with their lives, not applying anything that the scriptures had really commanded them to, be, to believe and, and, and ways to behave. 